Okay, hi. Um, I want to welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to make a few brief, brief comments before we actually start the PowerPoint so that everyone's kind of on the same page. This training today is not going to make anyone a competent person in confined space. What it's going to do is just familiarize you with the confined, the confined, confined space standard and also how it relates to construction. Uh, this is a new venture for construction. General industry has been involved in this for some time. And what you're going to see and should see on your, on your screen is a permit required confined space standard for construction, 29 CFR 1926, 112 through, uh, I'm sorry, 1201 through 1213. Uh, I'm going to follow this PowerPoint as if I were presenting it to a uh, in-house class. So I will be doing a lot of reading and I'll be, I'll be making comments on specific uh, issues in that standard that I think are going to be relevant. Uh, on the permit required confined space training, the changes to permit required confined space standards as they relate to the construction industry. Uh, I want to define what a confined space is, first of all, in case some of you, I will treat this as if some of you have never actually been in the confined space, and some of you do them on a regular basis, but want to make the adjustment to construction. A confined space means a space that is large enough so and so configured that in, anyone, an employee can bodily enter it, has limited or restricted means for entry and exit, and is not designed for continuous employee, employee occupancy. Permitted confined space means a confined space that has one or more of the following characteristics. And again, remember, it only needs one of these. Contains or has the potential to contain a hazardous atmosphere. Contains a material that has the potential for engulfing an entrance. Has an internal configuration such that an entrant could be trapped or asphyxiated by inwardly converging walls or a floor which slopes downward and tapers to a smaller section, cross section, or contains any other recognized serious safety or health hazard. The scope of, of this standard is that it applies to construction activities. It, it is enforced uh, as of August 3rd, 2015. I would expect to see compliance enforcement in October 2015. The standard does not apply to subpart P, excavations, subpart S, underground construction, caissons, coffer dams, and compressed air, and subpart Y, diving. Those particular sections and subparts have their own standard. That's why they stand alone or separated from this particular uh, implementation from OSHA. There are, uh, where these standards apply, and there is a provision that addresses a confined space hazard in another application, OSHA standard, the employer must comply with both that requirement and the provision of the standard. So there you're going to be dealing with a kind of a double regulatory responsibility. Some examples of spaces, just so that you that we understand what we're dealing with, are, and they're listed on your screen as bins, boilers, pits, manholes, electrical communication tanks, scrubbers, concrete pier columns, sewers. Uh, that list is going to be, should be pretty much all inclusive. There may be some in an area where you don't know what it's going to be or you have a question, if it comes to question, always make sure that you verify first that it is a confined space scenario or that it's going to be a confined space issue that you're dealing with. Oh, the scope of the work changes as far as construction and maintenance. An employer whose workers are engaged in both construction and general industry work in confined spaces will meet OSHA requirements if that employer meets the requirements of 29 CFR 1926 subpart AA, confined spaces in construction. And what we're going to have here is that we're going to have construction leapfrogging general industry. We've actually gotten more involved with construction aspect of, of this than we have had on the general industry. Now, I have a flow chart that I've presented here. The host employer, for an example for us, in Knoxville would be the University of Tennessee. And the controlling contractor would be a general contractor who's in place to do that work, whomever that may be. A lot of times the general contractor will have subcontractors working beneath them and, and occasionally that confined space will involve more than one subcontractor. So you see there a flow chart which, which talks about what you do from the host to the subcontractor as far as the entry and how do you coordinate the entry during that time. Uh, small spaces. This space is cramped but people can still enter and perform assigned work. It does not matter how cramped the space is. If a person can enter completely and perform work, it meets one of the criteria for confined space. Now, you see how small this is from that picture, but that would absolutely be a confined space, and there are issues that are going to define it. 
Uh, the limited and restricted means for entry or exit assessment. There's a couple of pictures there. What you see is you don't have to use your hands. I'm sorry, you do have to use your hands to enter or exit the space. Ladders will usually be considered a limited or restricted means of egress. Fixed stairs possibly would not. You can see from the picture on the left that you're going uh, in what looks like to be a manhole. And on the right, it's a walk-in type scenario for, say, a tunnel. So that issue on access egress means a lot as far as how you define your space. Uh, uh, do you have to contort your body in a way to get into the into or out of the space? You can see again on the left where you're crawling through a, a, a tunnel type device. Uh, that's certainly going to be a confined space scenario. But if it's a connex that's pictured on the right where you have easy access egress, it's not going to be as closely defined. If your entry into and exit from the space slowed down or uh, impeded by physical obstructions such as pipes, ductwork walls, holes in the floor, flanges, etc. And again, from the pictures you can see, if you don't have the pictures, I'll define it as a, as a straight walk out or into a particular space where you're not encumbered by piping and pre-existing HVAC or other things that would impede where you'd have to stoop, crawl, or other ways, uh, in other ways get out of or into that particular uh, confined space or space. So that's going to make it. Uh, that's going to define it for you. Uh, on the limited uh, and restricted means, again, OSHA intended that spaces which otherwise meet the definition of confined spaces and which have obstructed entry or exits, even though the, the portal is a standard-sized doorway, be classified as a confined space. So you're, they're saying, in in a, in, a, in a sense, that what I just defined to you is is accurate. That you're going to have to be able to get into and out of these on a, uh, in a normal uh, process for it not to be defined. Uh, would be forced to enter or exit in a posture that might slow self-rescue, escape, escape, or make rescue more difficult. When, on the left, when you're seeing that, where their staircase actually leads to the outside of the space, not a problem. But the one on the right, where you have the floating roof tank, you're actually going to go up a set of steps and onto transfer onto another set of steps, which will allow you to exit that space. That would be more defined as a confined space. Uh, fixed industrial stairs that meet OSHA standards will not usually be considered as a limited or restricted means of egress. Ladders or temporary movable spiral or articulated stairs will usually, usually be considered a limited or restricted means of egress. Continuous human occupancy does not mean uh, perpetually occupied. It doesn't have to be occupied uh, during the entire uh, time that the employees are at work. What it says is the space could be occupied continuously under normal operating conditions. So if you have a utility tunnel uh, connecting two facilities where uh, an employee may have to be in there for an extended period, it is suited for that. But it does not necessarily require that they're there constantly. An example is the vented telecommunications vault. Uh, what makes a confined space into a permit space? This is where you're going to have to make that decision as to whether you're going to have a permit required or, in fact, it's just going to be confined. A confined space is a permit space if it has one or more of four specific characteristics that make the space potentially hazardous. And again, one of four. Any one of these uh, characteristics make a confined space a permit space. Hazardous atmosphere, engulfing materials, which could be grain, it could be any, any type of silo configuration, inwardly converging walls where it's going to narrow down to the point to where, where it's going to be restrictive for someone to be able to breathe normally and could very well end up in an asphyxiation or other serious hazards. Let's review all four characteristics that make a confined space into a permit space. Uh, potential exposure. Likely, likely an exposure could occur during the entry. If you recognize that that hazard exists and there is the potential for it, you certainly want to recognize that as a permit required confined space. A hazardous atmosphere review definition may expose employees to risks of death, incapacitation, impairment of ability to self-rescue, injury, or acute illness from any one of five causes that are listed here. We have flammable gas, vapor, or mist, which is the standard, airborne combustible dust, which you're going to find in, in let's say, a, a, a syrup-making process where you have cornmeal. Uh, it's too, uh, too much or too little oxygen. When you get into that oxygen scenario where you have 19.5 uh, to 23.5, that ideal range, you're going to be OK. But once you get below that standard or, or go above that, that you're going to have, that's where these things are going to come into play. Acute acting air contaminants and other atmospheric conditions that, that could end up in IDLH, which is 
basically death will occur with exposure. Um, carbon monoxide is one good example of this. Carbon monoxide is odorless, colorless, colorless uh, combustion by product. It quick, uh, quickly uh, collapsed at high concentrations. And I've listed uh, the uh, permissible exposure level of 50. All of us are walking around every day with carbon monoxide in our systems. What you have to understand is that it has to be measured. When you, uh, and you're going to use a, a Q-ray type device to monitor carbon monoxide. And you want to make sure that you stay within that threshold where you don't have an alarm or whether you're not actively uh, involved in a, in a space that's above the PEL. The PEL, and again, these time rate averages are eight hours. Uh, for 200, it's three hours. For 600, one half hour. You're going to see that it, it gradually goes down. When you're up in the 2,000 to 2,500 range, you're going to become unconscious, and that's certainly life-threatening at that point. And that's only with 30-minute exposure. So this is something you're going to have to, and again, as you go on with your training, you're going to be trained on how to measure this and how to determine what the percentage of carbon monoxide that exists. Airborne combustible dust at a concentration creates a hazardous atmosphere. And we have a note here that suggests that if this occurs when dust obscures vision at a distance of five feet or less. Airborne combustible dust is another source of fires and explosions, though less common than gases or vapors. And to combust, the, air, uh, the airborne of most combustible dust must be so dense to discourage or prevent entry. That's a visual, that's a visual accusation that, that you're going to make by looking into and seeing what your, what your uh, opacity is for, for going through this particular uh, scenario. Sources of combustible dust include coke bunkers, chemical storage bins, process hoppers, grain silos. Combustible dust is generated by agriculture products, chemical plastics, pharmaceuticals, and metals. Normal air is, is 20.9 oxygen. You're going to read that almost anywhere you're at where you have a controlled ambient type air. Uh, concentrations below 19.5 or above 23.5 cause a hazardous atmosphere. Oxygen enrichment increases the flammable range and intensity of fire. If you enrich oxygen, you're going to have uh, a, a greater reaction to combustion than you will if you have normal oxygen. That's why high oxygen is such a concern. Extreme oxygen deficiency can result in a coma or asphyxiation. Slider deficiencies can impair physical health and mental capacity. You're going to know when that oxygen level goes down if you're wearing the proper uh, device, like a monitoring a meter. It's going to tell you when you're at that oxygen threat level. It's going to alarm, and you're going to evacuate. If you don't have that available, you're going to have physiological effects that you're going to recognize from lower oxygen, uh, whether it be that you become groggy, you become uh, your thinking process slows, uh, you're going to have physiological issues that you're going to that you're going to feel. Excuse me, you're going to feel too much too much oxygen is a hazard. Oxygen lowers the ignition temperature, which makes uh, materials much easier to ignite. Once ignited, they will burn most intense more intensely. Certain oils, greases, and finely divided metal particulates will spontaneously ignite in elevated oxygen levels where something may not combust at a normal rate of 20.9, by raising the oxygen, you're, all you're doing is heightening that combustibility of that particular material. As defined by OSHA, a hazardous atmosphere is created when the atmospheric oxygen concentration rises above 23.5. How it affects individuals is, is, is more of a euphoric type uh, sensation when you're breathing above 23.5. You can't sustain forever. It's not as threatening as a lower oxygen level, but high oxygen is certainly a concern. This, enriches, this enriched oxygen atmosphere increases uh, the range in which other materials will burn, and that's the big topic for confined spaces. What is going to be combust combustible, what's going to be flammable, and what triggers it? Oxygen can be displaced by a simple asphyxiation such as nitrogen or argon. When used, in, 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 when used inerting or, or methane, which is present in natural marsh and swamp gases. Methane is something you're going to find naturally uh, when when you when using an inert. You're going to you're going to self-inflict that. You're going to bring that uh, into the into the scenario. Oxygen can be consumed by uh, chemical reactions like oxi oxi oxidation. In other words, when ru metal rusts in tightly sealed spaces, or by decomposition of or organic materials, or if welding in space. Combustion welding can consume oxygen, and that's what's going to take your oxygen levels down. That's what that's what's going to threaten that 19.5 number is when you start doing things inside the space that traditionally aren't going to be part of that space. Oxygen can be absorbed by porous surfaces like damp, activated carbon. 
not to a, a great extent, but it certainly is enough to affect your level. And the oxygen deficiency atmospheres, again, and I've listed here, 19.5 would be the minimum acceptable oxygen level. And at, at being at 19.5, it's not ideal, but it's something that you can sustain normally. Once you get to the 15, 19 range, you're looking at this decreased ability to work uh, strenuously, impaired coordination, early symptoms, 12 to 14, respiration increases, poor judgment, 10, 10 to 12, lips turn blue, 8, uh, 8 to 10, you have fainting and nausea, 6 to 8, uh, could be fatal in six minutes, 50% fatal, in four to five minutes possible recovery, and at four to six percent of oxygen, a coma will, will, will certainly ensue and death will follow. So you need to really be cognizant of that oxygen level and pay attention. And the oxygen rich atmosphere, we're looking at oxygen levels above 23.5, causes flammable and combustible material to burn, again, violently when ignited, hair, clothing, materials, etc., oil-soaked clothing, materials, never use pure oxygen to ventilate. If you're, if you're welding inside a, a stainless tank or some other device, and you want you want to make and you want to try to purge that, you don't want to purge it with oxygen. That's just it's a common sense scenario that's happened in the past. I've actually been on cases where that's occurred. You need to make sure that you're purging with nitrogen or or and some inert gas, and never store or place compressed tanks in a confined space. You never take your work inside the tank with you, inside the vessel with you. You always want to make sure that you're positioned outside and you have the ability to do the work inside. Uh, immediately dangerous to life and health. The IDLH is the level, again, where we, we tend to see when we get to these higher levels, the condition that poses an immediate or delayed threat to life or would cause irreversible adverse health effects or would interfere with an individual's ability to escape unaided from a permit space. In other words, you've become dependent on someone else rescuing you. That's where you reach the IDLH. On the note on IDLH materials, who, who those effects are delayed. Some materials, hydrogen, fluoride, gas, uh, cadmium, vapor, may produce delayed uh, effects, possibly fatal collapse uh, after 12 to 72 hours of exposure. Victim feels normal from recovery until collapse. Such materials in hazardous quantities are considered to be immediately dangerous to life and health. The engulfment, uh, which I talked briefly about, surrounding uh, and capture of a person by a liquid or flowable solid, which could again be grain, uh, this uh, substance that can cause death by asphyxiation from breathing in the substance and just taking it into your lungs, or exerting enough force on the chest to make breathing difficult or impossible. That would be your uh, in your excavation scenario where you have a collapse. You can be collapsed up to your neck, have the head, your head completely above ground, and still die from asphyxiation based on the amount of pressure they're putting. But again, excavation doesn't come into play under this standard because it stands alone. The examples are grain, sand, sawdust, gravel, and plastic pellets. Uh, inward converging walls, and again, that uh, we talked about that getting going in from your entry entry position and actually being subjected to a, a smaller area where you're actually going to be constricted. The inwardly converging walls slope down and taper, come together, slide down the sloping walls, be, become stuck, and die of, of pressure on the chest that makes breathing impossible. And examples of this are hoppers for air pollution, dust collectors, in other words, bag houses, uh, electrostatic uh, precipitators, etc. Bottom-mounted unloading chutes for railroad cars and trucks, cyc cyclones and funnels. Those are just examples of that type uh, configuration that you need to worry about or be involved with. Other serious recognized hazards are uh, for respirators. Just because a worker wears a respirator does not mean it is a permit space. Uh, if a respirator is used to eliminate not, not nuisance air or uh, uh, something that, that just has a horrific smell where they just don't want to have to smell it all day, they can wear a respirator to avoid that. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's hazardous. It's just annoying. Uh, air contaminants, this is not an indication of potentially hazardous atmosphere. Don't confuse that. Uh, hydrogen sulfide has a terrible smell, but hydrogen sulfide is also very dangerous. So you have to make that determination based on what that atmosphere is. Uh, other serious uh, hazards of water in combination with other hazards, uh, however, could trigger application of uh, a PRCS standard. If the water uh, conceals trips and fall hazards such as abandoned uh, machine pads or floor holes and openings, the combination of these conditions may cause the confined space to be a permit space. In other words, you've created a new hazard or an additional hazard to the existing, which could cause it to be a permit required scenario. Uh, a, a little example of what you don't anticipate to be in these types of spaces, which very well could be. There is nothing more hazardous or toxic 
than uh, a bite from a rattlesnake or a, uh, a copperhead, a black willow spider, or a brown recluse. These things exist in these spaces, and you also have to be aware of that. If they exist, what, how do you deal with that particular situation? Now, on your non-permit confined space issues, non-permit confined space do not contain atmospheric hazards. And you've tested that, you've measured that, you've made that determination before you proceed that there is no ha uh, atmospheric hazard. So they don't contain it and do not contain a hazard capable of causing death or serious physical harm. These confined spaces do not require a permit because they do not contain serious hazards. Now, typical non-permit uh, confined spaces, some examples are vented vaults, uh, motor control cabinets, and drop ceilings. These uh, confined space, these confined spaces have e either natural or permanent mechanical ventilation to prevent the accumulation of hazardous atmosphere. In other words, they're self-ventilated. They're already up and running, so you're not going to have the atmosphere that you would anticipate if you went in and did welding stainless where you create hexavalent chromium or some other type of hazard, it would ventilate it out without you having to do additional ventilation. And they do not present engulfment or other serious hazards. So that's what, again, what you're looking at. A typical uh, example of a confined space would be uh, a manhole, a manhole that you have to get, whether it's sewer or utility or otherwise. That would be in every scenario, it can find space and most likely a permit required because you're going to have something else involved other than just that hole. And the general requirements, a competent person must identify all confined spaces and permit spaces. Host employer, controlling employer, contractor must inform exposed employees. Now you notice that, again, that, that order, that the host is obviously going to be the first in line for this flow chart and then the controlling employer, the contractor, if you have someone where you actually involved in one of those positions and you have someone in a confined space, you need to make sure you're involved in that process, that you understand the process and, and gone through the steps to verify that. You must have a written program prior and during permit space entry. You don't need one just to go in. You need to make sure that that space, that, that, that space permit is active and a living document because it is subject to change at all times. So you have to make sure that that's in place. The danger signs versus other means, danger signs most effective and economical. By putting the danger sign up, you avoid that cost of having a spotter there or having someone there that's going to warn of this hazard, and that's why they consider it to be more economical. Uh, equally effective means are, uh, are allowed as well as, as securing the opening to the space. Make it uh, inaccessible. Make it so that you can't get in it. Or effective training with interview follow-up to ensure that employees understand the danger. If you have people who are going to be subjected or exposed to this hazard, they have to be trained. They have to be given the opportunity to understand what the hazard is, how to, how to uh, recognize it, and how to remediate or at least deal with it if it comes up. Uh, if we know it is a, a permit confined space, so what are the options for entry? You've recognized now that we know it is. Number one, of course, is not to go in at all. Find another way. Uh, number two, reclassification to non-permit. Hazard control before entry, uh, for example, lockout tagout. No hazardous atmosphere exists, as well as the lockout tagout has been verified. You've not just locked it out, but you've verified, you've made sure there's no stored energy, and that there is no hazardous atmosphere involved. Uh, alternative entry, only a hazardous atmosphere that can be controlled by force air ventilation, all other hazards eliminated. So if you can control the atmosphere and all the other hazards have been taken out of the picture, then you certainly have an opportunity to, to come down or, or remove that permit required and make it a confined space. And then the other is just accept it as a permit required confined space under 1204 through, through 1212. Uh, permit process before uh, entry document completion of, of means, procedures, practices for safe entry under 1204C. Entry supervisor sign entry permit to authorize entry. It has to start there. There has to be somebody in charge of this particular process. And the supervisor traditionally is going to be the one that's going to generate the permit. He's going to sign off on the permit and make sure that everything's where it needs to be. Posting entry permits so entrants can confirm pre-entry measures. If you're putting someone in the confined space, especially permit, permit required confined space, make sure they're aware of everything that exists within that confined space. You want to make sure they're aware of all the hazards and what the uh, hazards of entrance are going to be. Uh, the duration of permit may not exceed the time required to complete the job. 
the duration of the permit may not exceed the time required to do the job. So if you have a permit that says you're going to be out there at 5 p.m., you have to come out at 5 p.m. because that's what it's engineered for. That's the only allowable scenario in that permit. Uh, we're going to come to something a little bit later that's going to address that. Uh, uh, entry supervisor must terminate entry. The entry supervisor must terminate. If there's a cause for termination, it's done by the supervisor. Cancel entry permit when operators have been completed, when operations have been completed. In other words, the job's done. You cancel the permit. It's no longer viable. You no longer can use it to go into that space. Suspend or cancel the entry permit when the condition is not allowed on permit arises. Something came up that you didn't anticipate, some hazard, some atmosphere that you didn't see or didn't anticipate being there. You cancel or suspend that permit at that time. Uh, Entry employer must retain each cancel permit, review within one year, any problems must be noted. Once you come out of there, you have up to a year to get everyone together and review that permit and recognize what the hazards were, if you detected that there were hazards, and what, uh, what to expect. The authorized entrance responsibilities, and we're going to cover these individually. individually. The duties of the authorized entrant, that's who's going into the space. Alert attendant and, uh, and exit when there is any warning sign or symptom of exposure to dangerous situations. In other words, you've made your entry into the space and something has happened. Your alarm, your uh, Q-ray has gone off indicating there's a low oxygen, a high oxygen, indicating there's hydrogen sulfide or some, something else, carbon monoxide, that changes that configuration, uh, detects a prohibited condition, which would again be one of these uh, scenarios. An order to evacuate is given by the attendant or the entry supervisor. As the entry entrant, you have to listen to the attendant and to the supervisor. You're actually, uh, they're controlling your environment. They're the ones that make that decision, and you must exit. You cannot argue that point. You cannot defend uh, your situation and say, well, the carbon dioxide is only 40 or 50, and I don't feel like that's a problem. You have to get out. Uh, an evacuation alarm is activated. In other words, the QA or some other meter has gone off. You have to get out and remediate or at least determine what caused it to, to go off. Once you've done that and you, you're, you're comfortable that whatever the issue was has been resolved, then you can certainly go back in at that point. The attendant's responsibilities. This is the person outside. This is the person that's really going to be controlling this environment. You can also be the entry supervisor. I don't suggest that you wear both hats. I don't suggest you take on both roles because uh, you need the attendant to focus entirely on that uh, entry and nothing more. So I don't, I don't encourage it, but it's something, something that OSHA recognizes as a possibility. You have to be familiar with the hazards, the mode, signs, symptoms, and consequences of exposure. By identifying the consequences, what you're saying is that you recognize that it's carbon monoxide, and you know what the physiological effects of carbon monoxide are. If it's uh, any other X chrome or any other scenario, you have to understand what those are and how, how those will be treated upon exposure. Aware of possible behavioral effects of chemical hazard to entrance, what kind of effects are you looking for? What, what are, they, again, the physiological issues that you're experiencing with that entrant? Are they groggy? Are they non-responsive? Uh, at what stage are they being affected by this atmosphere? Continuously maintain an accurate count of entrance in the permit space. Under 1206D, require list on permit. If you're going into that space, you better be on the permit. You should not have, allow anyone in that's not on the permit as an, as an entrant into that space. And it doesn't matter who that is. Uh, performs no duties that will interfere with the primary responsibility of watching that entry. That's their only duty. They cannot go to the bathroom. They cannot take a smoke break. They have to, to entirely pay, put 100% of their attention on that space. Remains outside to permit space during entry operations until relieved by another attendant. And that attendant also has to be trained and competent to, in order to take over that, that particular entry. Once relieved by another can attempt rescue. If that's part of your process on your permit where you're going to try to do rescue or you have a, a setup process where that is to, to happen, as the uh, attendant, you cannot attempt a rescue until someone's in place to take, take over for you that will observe. It must be trained and equipped for rescue. It has to be part of your, your plan again. Communication with entrants to assess status and alert need to get out. You have to continually maintain a communication uh, process with them, whether it be 
through a safety line, whether it be through verbal communication, whether it be uh, through any other electrical device, you have to continue to maintain that, that contact. Summon rescue and emergency and determines who needs assistance. That person on the outside, that attendant, has to be the one to call for help. They have to be the one that's, that recognizes that there's a situation, and they have to make the necessary calls. And those calls should be predetermined. This is not uh, not something you're going to do on the, on the run. You're going to have this all set up so you know who to call and when to call them and what emergency or what you're dealing with to make sure that you can alert whoever's going to go in. Takes the following action when unauthorized persons approach or enter permit space while entry is underway. This is what, as the attendant, you need to understand. Uh, you warn the unauthorized persons to stay away, regardless of their status or who they are. If they're not on your permit, they have no business and no reason to be anywhere near your entry. Advises the unauthorized person to exit immediately. You have to have the autonomy or the authority to make that kind of, uh, of order and enforce it. Informs uh, author excuse me, informs authorized entrance and entry supervisor of unauthorized persons have entered the space. If someone gets in, they refuse to comply, refuse to listen to your orders, or find another way in, you need to make sure that everybody in the space is aware that there is someone in there that's not supposed to be. The entry supervisor's responsibilities be familiar with, uh, with and understand the hazards, the signs, the mode, and the symptoms of chemical exposure. And this goes back to the permit again. Have somebody as a supervisor who understands what these hazards are because you've pre-identified them. You've made sure that they're completely listed on your, on your entry permit as, as to what that hazard might be and how to deal with that hazard if it shows up. Verify permit all tests, all procedures, and equipment before endorsing permit for entry. You want to make sure that you're paying attention to these these topics. You want to verify the permit, make sure that the permit is accurate, check the tests that were being done to make sure they were also accurate, and know all the procedures and equipment before endorsing it. Terminates entry and cancels or suspends permit. Now this suspends permit and cancel permit are going to come up in just a bit, and that's where the difference is with general industry and construction. But we're going to talk about that. And verifies rescue services are available and means of summoning. Uh, removes unauthorized individual who enters space and ensures entry remains consistent with terms on permit. Now, rescue and emergency responsibilities. Let me say off this, uh, again, off the PowerPoint. When I do one of these permits, and it's, it's generally done in a, in a populated area or a place where, where you have a lot of people, I traditionally will partner with a, an emergency rescue uh, plan within the community. I'll look, I'll look to their emergency response team and try to coordinate with them and try to get them on board. I will let them come out prior to this and even do a walkthrough and, and do their own assessment of that confined space. I'm going to use them as my rescue team. I'm going to use them as, as who, I'm, who I'm going to call in the event there's, a, there's an issue. This, this works out very well. It's very cost effective. And these are professional people that, were, that, that are being paid to do this type of work. Most of the time, you're going to get favorable response. You're going to get them to buy in, and they're going to participate. So no entry rescue is required unless the retrieval equipment increases the risk of entry and would not contribute to the rescue. If you have someone in a, in a confined space, and they're on a tripod, and they're conscious that they need to be assisted in getting out, you want to use that tripod for, for extraction. You want to make sure you use it properly. If you don't, if you can't do entry rescue, employer must designate an entry rescue service. Now, if you can't provide that tripod or you have issues with trying to do the rescue, again, identify who's going to do it, make sure that they're in close proximity, and make sure it's feasible, that they can get there in time to do what they need to do. Uh, the employer rescue retrieval systems uh, could vary. The mechanical device must be available to retrieve personnel from vertical spaces more than five feet in depth. You, if you're going in 20, 50 to 20 feet, make sure that what you're using is, 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 is OK for that particular rescue attempt. Tripods traditionally will go a lot deeper depending on, on, on the type of tripod that you use. Set up so rescue can be immediate. Make sure that you have immediate and, current and constant contact with the entrant in case the, the rescue is, is required. And then require use of a full body harness unless it creates a greater hazard. Uh, wristlets and anklets may be an alternative, but keep in mind, with wrist, wristlets, wrist, wristlets and anklets, you also have to consider how you're going to get them out. I don't encourage that process, but sometimes if you're doing a, a vertical entry, it may be the only way that you can actually maintain contact with them, uh, other than a lifeline. Uh, do not use a system that is incompatible with the space. Extraction lines may become entangled. And that's where the wristlets and anklet type scenarios come in, where you're going over and under piping and, and, and 
issues that exist in the confined space. Make sure you've assessed that before the entry so you know that whatever you're using will pull them out and, and, and clear them from the hazard. Hoist, if hoisting systems is used, must be designed and manufactured for personal hoisting. Uh, can use job-made hoist systems but must be approved by a registered professional engineer in writing before you use it. Don't just use something you configured in your shop or in an area and put it together and say, okay, this is how we're going to do it. Make sure that an engineer has looked at it and signed off on it. Uh, select a rescue team or service that has the capability to reach the victim within a time frame appropriate for the permit space hazard identification. Make sure, again, if you're going to use a community group like an emergency response team, that they had the capability of doing what you need them to do. Uh, review it, rehearse it, uh, have uh, do a, a dry run even if you have that opportunity. It's the best case scenario for that. And it uh, is equipped for and uh, proficient in performing the needed rescue service. Make sure that if it's a local group, that that's not a local group that's never done a rescue. You want to make sure you identify your task, identify, identify the entry, what the hazards are, and that they can deal with those hazards. Agrees to notify the employer immediately when not available. Now, if this is a uh, uh, an out, out in the, the outlying areas of the city where it's a volunteer group or, or some other type group, and they may not be because they're on another call, they need you need to agree with them that they're going to notify you that they're out of service or they're not going to be able to respond, so you end your entry at that time because you have no backup if you don't have another plan. So make sure that you coordinate with them, that they contact you when there's a fire or when there's a time that they cannot do this. Inform each rescue team or service of the hazards they may confront when called on to perform a rescue at, at the site. Well, you, you want to make sure, again, they're aware of what these, uh, these hazards are, that you've identified them, them and that they are capable of dealing with those types of hazards, whether they have to go on air through SCBA, supplied air, uh, or that the hazard is, is whether it's uh, a lethal hazard or whether it's just a uh, oxygen deficient hazard. Make sure they know going in what you're doing. Provide the rescue team or service access to all permit spaces from which rescue may be necessary so they can develop appropriate rescue plans and practice operations. And again, that's what I was talking about. Get them out there and don't be afraid to go through a couple of dry runs with them. Partner with them. Uh, I've done that in the past where I've provided HAZWOPER training for uh, an EMR uh, emergency management or emergency response group in a small community that couldn't afford the training. We kind of traded off to where we're, uh, we were able to, uh, I trained them and they were able to respond. Uh, rescuers account for 50% of confined space fatalities. What that means is the second person in or the person going in to try to save the per first person who's down without, without following the procedure or the practice in place. You want to discourage attendants from ever going in unless they're part of the rescue process. Uh, and I know it's difficult to do, and sometimes it's very hurtful, but you have to make sure that they, they do their, their due diligence to continue to monitor that and make sure they make the calls they need to call and notify the people that need to be called for the uh, extraction. Uh, the entry employer's responsibilities to permit confined space program. Now, again, the entry employer responsibilities, that's how that flow chart works. Develop and implement means, practice, uh, procedures, practices for safe entry, specify acceptable entry conditions, provide each entrant opportunity to observe monitoring and testing, uh, isolate physical hazard, purging, inerting, flushing, ventilating, permit space to eliminate or control atmospheric hazards, and below 10% of legal levels. Make sure that the, the employer understands all these steps and is involved in these steps. Ensure monitoring procedure can detect if ventilation stops and time to exit safely. If, you're, if your uh, meters stop functioning, if there's an issue with the meter, that's when you end the entry again. You come out, you repair, you replace, and then you can certainly uh, restart your process again. Barriers protect entrance from external hazards, vehicles, and pedestrians. You want to make sure you barricade if it's a, uh, a manhole or that type of scenario, that type of setup, that you barricade because, because of issues of fall and someone walking into that uh, opening that doesn't need to be there and verify conditions and permit space acceptable for entry throughout the duration. It doesn't end just because you've made the entry. It ends when you re-secure that and make it uh, safe for everyone around. That's when the entry, that's when the actual process ends. Uh, provide at no cost, maintain properly, and ensure use, use properly, test and monitoring equipment. When you require your employees to go into a space, everything that you require them to have, you should provide as an employer. You should make sure that they have the proper testing, the right equipment, uh, the right PPE to do that type of entry.
uh, you want to make sure that you continuously monitor atmospheric conditions if they exist, if, if it's something that could reoccur after you've ventilated, after you've taken the steps to make it safe, if that possibility exists where that atmosphere could start again, if you're near a uh, wastewater treatment facility where you have uh, hydrogen sulfide. Make sure that, that once you've gotten that out and gotten to that level, that you continue to monitor and make sure it's not seeping back in uh, during the time of the entry. Test for O2, flammable combustible gases, vapors, toxics, uh, toxic gases and vapors. Provide observation and results of testing. When you do this testing, you're going to document this. You're going to write this down every every few minutes as to what your levels are. When that when that's completed and done, make sure that the entrants aware of that. Review it with them so there's no concern on their part that they were exposed to something that they may not have been exposed to, or that they're aware of what the concerns are. And just review it with them uh, at the end and reevaluate permit space if uh, the entry employer requests it. Uh, not adequate. Just, just to talk about it. You have to re-evaluate the permit and make sure that after it's done, that everything was done that could be done. Uh, provide it no cost to maintain uh, and ensure again used properly. Develop and implement use of uh, cancellation of entry permits. Stake termination under both planned and emergency conditions. Develop and implement so that it's in place if you do have to cancel that permit. Develop and, imp and implement entry operations which, with controlling contractor, if more than one employer in space or activities endanger another employer in or out of the space. When there's some type of conduct within that entry, within that space that causes the problem, you have to make sure that everybody's brought out and the employer is, is, is notified that that exists. And that can be doing things that they're not supposed to do. That can be welding and, and welding stainless again, and not, not recognizing that hexavalent chromium is an issue in that. And they've done that and not notified you or it's not on the permit. You need to stop come out and then reassess. Develop and implement procedures to conclude entry, closing office space and canceling the permit. You have to make sure that's in place. Once the permit is, is once the space has is, is become contaminated or once once it's not safe, you have to you have to again close off the space and cancel cancel the permit until you've fixed or resolved the problem. Review entry operations and re, and revise to correct deficiencies before reentry. Everything that goes bad has to be remediated. Everything that goes bad has to be fixed before you can do a reentry. Review programs using canceled permits within one year. And again, uh, you can't perform one single review of all entries. Uh, testing for atmosphere in a confined space. I talked about that. Uh, stratification of gases and vapors. These are things, a couple of things I, put, I pointed out that you, you, you should be aware of. Uh, uh, if the gas is lighter, uh, less dense than air, uh, as in methane. You're going to you're going to know you need to know where you need to test for methane. If methane is a concern, uh, or you suspect that methane is going to be a problem, you don't want to go to the bottom of the tank or the space and test for it. You want to test where it's going to accumulate. If the gas is the same as air with carbon monoxide, you want to make sure that you test the entirety of the, of the space. Go from top to bottom and, and test uh, random testing for carbon monoxide because it does have the capability of pocketing. And if uh, gases are denser and heavier than, say, argon, you want to go all the way to the bottom of the uh, sewer for sewer gas. So you want to make sure that you know what you're testing for and you know the proper procedure for testing. The ventilation considerations, again, are the ventilation, uh, the ventilation air should not create an additional hazard. You don't want to pump something into that space that's not uh, ambient, 20.9 uh, oxygen rich type, uh, type air. You want to make sure that what you're pumping in is good and sustainable. Uh, the recirculation of contaminants uh, does you no good. You need to know when to pull air out of the space and when to supply air to a space. Uh, you have to make that determination, especially if it's an issue where there are particulates involved. You don't want to stir them up inside, so you want to pull the air out at that time. But you can make that assessment on your own. The, uh, the substitution of any other than fresh or normal air, approximately 20.9 20, oxygen, 78.1 nitrogen, and 1% argon with small amounts of of various other gases is sustainable. Uh, do's and don'ts, never enter a confined space that has not been properly assessed or pre uh, prepared. If you, again, everything that you do, and I know the attic and cellar issues are going to come up, an attic is a confined space unless you determine it's not. And that's what OSHA has come up with this standard for, is to tell you, hey, in construction, you're not paying attention. 
these things that exist out there can be hazardous, they can be confined spaces, and we need to draw your attention to it. So this is why the standard's out here. It's just saying that you're going to be more aware and more attentive to these issues. Assess all hazards control methods identified. Make sure that, again, you recognize if you see the hazard and, and, and put some control in place, some method in place to deal with it. Appropriate control measures implemented to eliminate and control the identified hazard remediate whatever the existing issue is, and atmospheric monitoring conducted to, uh, to address potential hazards. If a uh, hazardous atmosphere has existed, ever did exist, or has the potential to exist, make sure that you continue to monitor until that, until that space is secure, until that pro the project is finished. Always retest a uh, confined space whenever conditions change. They could create hazardous atmosphere. And uh, doing in, uh, a confined space entry near a, a thoroughfare, near a heavily trafficked area, you have the risk of carbon monoxide becoming an issue. Again, next to a wastewater treatment facility, you have a hydrogen sulfide, which could be an issue. Anticipate that and test the air prior to that. Uh, in 1207, we talk about training. In a language or vocabulary, they can understand. Uh, some, some of us have bilingual workforces. And we need to understand this is pretty intense training, and it has to be conveyed in whatever language that they understand, whatever the comfort level for that particular team member is. You have to make sure you train them in that language. The foreign employee is first assigned duties under the standard. These are, again, training that is required before there is a change in assigned duties. When you're taking someone out of your uh, entry uh, group and assigning them somewhere else and bringing somebody new in, the training has to be done again for that particular individual. Whenever there is a change in permit space, entry operations that presents a hazard about which an employee has not previously been trained. Again, the hazard has not been identified on the initial permit. A new hazard comes into play, it has to be trained on. You've added something to the original entry permit, everybody has to be trained on that hazard. Whenever there is evidence of a deviation from permit space entry required under 1204C, develop, implement the means, procedures, and practices for safe entry. Uh, specify acceptable entry conditions. You have to reevaluate and you have to uh, redo the plan so that it covers all those, those new issues that come up. At no cost, ensure employees, uh, employee possesses the understanding, knowledge, and skills understanding the hazards and methods used to isolate, control, and protect. No attempt to rescue if not authorized to enter. If you're not authorized to go into it, as I said with the attendee, the attendees traditionally are not going to be trained uh, as, as an entry, entrant would. So if they're not trained, no rescue, no attempt. Be qualified or don't do it. Establish proficiency in the duties. Practice it. If you have confined space issues or a team that's going to do this, and you do this on a regular basis, don't be afraid to practice. Don't be afraid to do this more than uh, when it's needed. Maintain training records under 1207A and C. Employees' name, name of trainers, and dates of training. Maintain records for review and keep while employed. This can come back. Uh, I've got an example within our company where someone came in seven years after the fact and wanted to, to uh, file a claim for, uh, uh, for exposure to silica. And uh, it had to be something that was adjudicated, but it can come back. So make sure that you maintain these records for as long as you can maintain them. The different uh, differences between 1910, which is the general industry standard, and 1926. More detailed provisions coordinating activities than multiple employers at the work, work site, requiring a competent person to evaluate the work site and identify the uh, permit required space, requiring continuous atmospheric monitoring, whenever possible, requiring continuous monitoring of engulfment hazards. For example, when workers are performing work in a storm sewer, a storm upstream for the workers could cause flash flooding. An electronic sensor or observer posted upstream from the work site could alert workers in the space at first sight, at first sign of hazard, giving the workers time to evacuate the space safely. So it, they're asking you to look ahead. They're asking you to prepare yourself for the worst case scenario on these. And, and this, under 1910 and 26, most of these are, are consistent. There are a few things that aren't going to be consistent, but that one is. Here's one that, that stands out, the suspension of a permit instead of cancellation. And in the construction standard, we can suspend without having to reissue another permit. But the reason we can do this is the changes from the entry conditions listed on the permit are an unexpected event requiring evacuation of the space. The space must be returned to the entry conditions listed on the permit before reentry. Now, what they're saying is we'll allow that, that permit to stand We'll, uh, we'll suspend it, but you, you must return this hazard, this uh, 
permit, this permit or this entry or this space to where it was when you initially went in the first time before you can go back in. That keeps us from having to continue to go over and, and reissue a canceled permit. So we can do that in construction. Uh, if relying on local emergency services, arrange for responders to give the employer advance notice if they will be unable to respond for a period of time. And what they're telling you, again, we're revisiting this. It's a little redundant, but you need to, to do that. You need to practice that when you're contacting a, a local response group and you're saying, uh, okay, when you're not available, I need you to contact me in the event I'm in a confined space. The other part of that is that when you go into a space, you need to give them a call as well and say, hey, a heads up, we're going into this space at whatever time. We anticipate being there for so many hours, and I wanted to put you on alert that we're in there so that if something changes or you can't respond, you can notify me. So you can be proactive with that as well. Requiring employers to provide training in a language and vocabulary that the worker understands. And again, the, those of you who are bilingual or who work in a bi bilingual environment need to understand that. If you're going to train, train within the language that, that is comfortable for that particular employee. Entry employers give the controlling contractor info about their entry program and hazards they encounter in the space. Controlling contractor passes that information on to other entry employers and back to the host. So what you're doing is communicating this whole process from the beginning, from the owner, all the way down to the subcontractors. And you're talking about this. You're talking about the process and what you went through and all the steps you took to make it safe. And it was, and it was a successful entry. And the best way to make sure it's successful next, next time is to talk about it. Uh, and that really is, is all that, I can, that I, I can provide under this limited amount of time. But can, again, continue to remember that as a competent person, you're going to need more additional training. You're going to need to, to make sure that, that you're, you're, you're putting this out there and, and that you continue to train yourself as these go because these, these conditions will change. Uh, Wayne, I think you said there may be questions. Hi, Gary. Thanks. Um, we actually do have a, a, a couple of questions, and they all deal with crawl space or attics. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I anticipated that. Let me just uh, fire off a couple here. So uh, we're a large residential contractor. Um, what do I have to do with crawl space and attic entry? Um, I want to comply, but we're in hundreds of crawl spaces and attics daily. Um, OK. What you have to make sure is you can, you, that you treat each one individually. Don't assume because one was safe that the other's going to continue to be safe. Uh, you want to look at uh, what the hazards might be or what reasonably they could be. If you can eliminate that as far as if you have natural gas, if it's an existing dwelling or, or, or building that's been there for some time where they've actually had uh, supplied gas or natural gas, or if, uh, if there's uh, something running in that area where carbon monoxide might be, my suggestion would, would clearly be buy a, a Q-ray. And I'm saying Q-ray because that's just what I use. There are a number of meters out there. But I would invest in a, in a meter, a four gas meter, and I would test the atmosphere on each and every entry that you do. Make sure that once you test it, you're going to establish and document that. Well, th this attic was at 20.8, 20.9 no issues, no concerns for hazardous atmosphere. Are there fall issues involved? Are there electrical issues involved? And then identify those. And when you, when you do your entry, make sure that you're, you're aware. Because they're not, again, all going to be confined, a permit required confined space. You can have a confined space and not have to do a permit because you recognized and identified it as being confined. In other words, those four criteria don't exist. Is it easy to get into? Is it, easy, uh, is it uh, designed for human occupancy? If those exist, all those exist, and you don't have a confined space. But what the uh, what OSHA wants you to do is is at least is identify it on on crawl spaces. Now I was talking specifically about attics and crawl spaces as well. But you're going to have things like radon. Radon radon is not an acute issue. Radon is something that takes time. It takes uh, extended exposure for. You're going to probably see that in in some of these dwellings and some of these crawl spaces, but it's not something that we really are concerned with as a contractor because we're not going to spend that much time down there. Uh, but again, this is something to do with ventilation. You, if you have the opportunity, I would invest in a fan and a, and a vent hose and start ventilating these spaces. Don't wait for something to be determined. Just do it as, as a practice, and it'll eliminate a lot of these issues. Um, the person uh, said that, that they have over 150 technicians, and um, so what is considered safe? And, and all these homes are occupied. So uh, the only way you're going to render them or determine if they're safe is to to eliminate the hazard, or to at least try to identify what hazard you might anticipate being in there. Um, that that 
you know, that could be nothing. But what OSHA is going to require that you do is at least make the effort to say, okay, I have a, an attic in an existing dwelling that we're working in, and uh, I've determined that it's not there are no hazards. How are you going to how are you going to determine that unless you test it? And that's what they want. Not continuously monitoring necessarily, but at least go in initially and say, okay, OSHA is going to come out and say, what did you do? to make sure this was not a uh, permit required confined space. And what you're going to answer is, I did air monitoring. I did testing over a period of time. Use a time rate average of four hours or eight hours and put a meter on someone working up there. If it does not alarm within eight hours, there's, there's a r good reason to believe that it's not an issue. And you can show that, that information to OSHA that you, in fact, did do this. And that even if you want to ventilate it, if you, want to, if you suspect there may be an issue uh, or there could be something you're not detecting, I would start ventilating and just ventilate each one as, as I go. The CFM, or the amount of air that you need to circulate, would certainly depend on the hazard that you're dealing with. But in a residential attic, uh, do you have asbestos? Do you have other things that, that could, could be part of that process? Because the confined space deals with all hazards, not just uh, specific types of hazards, but all. Uh, again, I, I mentioned fall. I mentioned electrical. Uh, assess them. Go through them and make sure that there are no hazards that exist. So let's just take one more here, if possible. Um, so we require all of our entry supervisors to be first aid, CPR, and trained on how to use the tripod to rescue. Um, do we need to have outside rescue on standby? No. No. Uh, that's got to be evaluated per entry. Depends on, uh, and again, there's nothing in the standard that requires all first aid responders or first aid trained. Doesn't say that. There's a number. There's a ratio. What they what they're saying is that first aid is not going to be uh, an issue with a confined space. What you're dealing with in confined space would would traditionally be something above first aid, something that's more critical than first aid, where you're going to have to have medical treatment. So first aid is is not a, uh, uh, an issue with this. Uh, if you're going to use a tripod, you certainly want to train uh, entries. A lot. Of, I've seen people actually lower people into spaces using the tripod, and that's not what it's designed for. Once you shock that retriever, once you shock that winch, that winch has to come out of service. So that's certainly not not a way to, that you want to use. You want to have a ladder or some means of entry, access, egress, other than that that uh, tripod. All that tripod is designed for is retrieval. Uh, as far as first aid responders or first aid trained, I encourage first aid training, but it's not a requisite for entry. It's not something that the standard says everyone has to be trained in. Okay, um, let's just do one more here, if that's okay. Does oxyacetylene brazing in an attic or a crawl space require monitoring of the air quality and constant ventilation? It depends on, on the percentage. It depends on, first of all, how are you determining that? Uh, there must be a process that you're using, and there's an, uh, an LEL, a PEL for that, that, that hazard that exists, you need to know what the PEL, permissible exposure level, is for that. And if you look at that and monitor it, it's less than that, it's not an issue. If it's above that, then certainly you do have to, uh, to remediate that. But that would, that would come with your, uh, all you have to do is look at the SDS for that particular chemical or that particular uh, issue, and it'll tell you on the SDS what the uh, PEL, is, the permissible exposure level is. You monitor it, and if you determine it's over that, yes. You would have to ventilate. You would have to make sure that either you ventilate or supply air for that process. Are all multi-gas testers okay to use? Uh, no, not no, because uh, the PIDs are designed for uh, for uh, anhydrous ammonia. There are different types. There are natural gas sniffers. There are a number of different meters. What you want to traditionally look for is a four gas. You want to look for a meter that does oxygen, hydrogen sulfide, carbon carbon monoxide and uh, carbon dioxide. You want those four gases on that meter. And all Q-rays, and I say Q-ray again because there's, there's a number of them out there. But what you're looking for, what you're determining is, the biggest issue is what your oxygen level is. Because with carbon monoxide, when you get a high level of carbon monoxide, it's not the carbon monoxide that's, that's the problem. It's the reduction of oxygen. Uh, high, uh, uh, carbon monoxide isn't its asphyxia. It will cause you to suffocate because it it takes the oxygen out of the air and replaces it with carbon monoxide. So that meter would tell you when the oxygen levels are down, and it'll tell you what the, the carbon monoxide levels are so that you can anticipate. And again, it won't alarm at 25. Carbon monoxide uh, can be there at 25 uh, parts per million and not be an issue. 
uh, that four gas meter can be, it has to be a four gas that identifies those, that group of gases. So a PID would do you no good when you're talking about oxygen levels. Let me, let me say this real quick, that the, the full complement, the full original uh, PowerPoint has a lot more in-depth information. I, I was just restricted for time, but if, if they get that and review that, there's a lot of these questions that are answered in that, in that PowerPoint. So that should help them. Awesome. All right, Gary, thank you for the great presentation. It was very informative, and uh, we hope to see you again soon. Okay, thank you. All right, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today.